Uh, I'm uh, Robbie Bush, the Secretary of the Royal Scottish Academy. I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Wendy McMurdo. Um, Wendy specialises in photography and digital media and holds a doctorate publication from the University of Westminster for her photographic work, exploring the impact of the computer on our collective identities. Her work is included in a number of major collections and has featured in a wide variety of exhibitions, including the Anagrammatical Body, The Body and Its Photographic Condition, ZKM, Karl Ruhs, Germany, and Canny Photo Museum Winterthur, and Only Make Believe, curated by Marina Warner or Compton Verney Warwickshire. In 2017, she was commissioned by the Photographer's Gallery in London to produce a new work for their media wall. Uh, in 2018, it was named as one of the 100 heroines uh, by the Royal Photographic Society. In September 21, she'll be included in Imaging the Future at Shanghai Photo Fair. Wendy's a graduate of uh, Goldsmith College. She was awarded a two-year fellowship by the Henry Moore Foundation. Her first major solo show, In a Shaded Place, in 1993, was where her work with computers began. The body of work became successful internationally touring show uh, for the British Council. Wendy initially trained as a painter at Edinburgh College of Art before developing her practice as a photographer at the Pratt Institute New York and then at Goldsmiths University of London. Her work is in the collections of the British Council, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, the Henry Art Gallery Seattle and the Photo Museum in Winterthur amongst others. This evening, she is going to give a brief introduction to this work and also discuss recent projects, Night Garden, which was shown at Inverleith House here in Edinburgh as part of the group show Floriginium in late 2020. Laurel, I can't pronounce that, Wendy. Anyway, it's great pleasure to welcome Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, thanks for that, that introduction, um, Robbie, and thank you, everyone. Um, who has turned up tonight? I, I realise there's there's a lot of kind of online sort of events, and um, most evenings now during the pandemic. And uh, as I said, thank you for for giving up the time, and thanks too to Robbie um, for hosting which this event tonight. I mean, as you'll probably know, um, it's one of a series of um, open studio events. I mean, I, I, I've done online talks, but I've, I've never done <laughs> open studio ones. So, welcome. To my, to my studio. Um, I think, you know, for, what I'm going to do tonight is we've got about an hour, you know, and I, and I don't really know um, if I'm talking to photographers or if I'm talking to people who just love photography or if I'm talking to obviously talk to friends of the RSA. Um, but I thought, I thought I'd just talk to you a little bit about, um, about my practice, how it started. You may have some particular questions if, for example, you are sort of interested as a photographer yourself, maybe you know, theoretical, technical questions that you want to ask, and feel, feel free to, to ask these. Um, I produced, I've got a presentation which, which I'm going to go to, but don't worry, it's, it's, there's, there's no sort of reading from a paper, it's just really looking at some sort of key images. Um, as Robbie said in his introduction, um, I work with photography and sort of digital media, although I guess that from the beginning of my career, certainly in photography, I was always very interested in the limits of what photography was and I was never, I was really interested I suppose in picturing something that you couldn't see through the optical viewfinder. I was really much more interested I suppose on looking at the kind of sort of, um, yeah, the more experimental end of sort of what photography was in the early to mid 90s and what it might become. And I think you'll see as we look through the work that that kind of interest, that keen interest in the the, the in, in where photography is going, um, is sort of pervades most of the work. So it's a it's an open studio, <laughs> so you can see behind me that this is very much where I work. You know, I, a lot of my work is done. Um, I shoot on with a camera. Actually, I don't use kind of. Um, I'm not making 3D models or working with AI, which I think a lot of really kind of interesting uh, young photographers are working with that kind of, sort of technology now and, and completely bypassing the camera to make images which have the appearance of photographic images. And that's something I'm certainly very interested in. 
you know, as somebody who's sort of looking at photography, but for me, my work, I suppose, is a combination of sort of traditional uh, photography. But by that, I mean, it's using a camera with a lens. <laughs> In fact, my camera is just behind me there, using a digital camera, but also using sort of various techniques. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I use these as I work the way through the slides. So the word that Robbie had problems with at the end of that introduction was florilegium. And uh, for the people that are coming here tonight that are from Edinburgh, they may well have seen Floral Legium because it was a really great show, actually, I think, that was at Inverleith House, which is now called Climate House, which is part of the Royal Botanical Gardens. Um, so I'm going to conclude the talk with a little run through of that piece, Floral Legium, which may be of interest. If you look in the back wall behind me, you can actually see a strange kind of sort of staff. <laughs> And that is the, the stalk of a large plant which formed the basis of Night Garden. There's a piece that I produced um, as a kind of memoriam in a, it to, to my mother actually um, last year. So I'll talk a little bit about the end. You can also see sort of uh, uh, portraits, a picture of a hand. I'm going to pull on these images as we work through the presentation and to give you a little run through. I'll, let's see how the time goes. I'll, I'll get through as much as I can about them quite informally. And then Robbie's gonna share sh a short one and a half minute clip from a film and then I'll, sh I'll show some more images. So let me just uh, share this with you. Right, okay. So I think we're slide sharing. So this, what I'm going to talk about really for the first sort of quarter of the presentation is the work that I've done looking, the early work looking at the lives of children. Now, what's been of great interest to me from the mid 90s when I started to look at the subject until relatively recently, maybe about two or three years ago, is the huge impact that, that computation actually, um, digitality, the computer has had on the lives of children. And a lot of the work that I've produced um, has been directly looking at that subject. And it's something that I've been interested in for 25 years, 20 years since I started working in the mid nineties. Um, I'm actually, if I look to my right, I can see a school at the bottom of my garden. And that is a primary school here in Edinburgh where I'm based that I did, a, that I shot a lot of this work actually. Um, so I've been working in, with local communities and communities of children for quite a long time. Um, this is a portrait, this is a portrait from a, P, a project called Let's Go to a Place. Um, and I'm going to show some installation shots of this work um, as I move through the next slides. This is me, <laughs> I'm sure the likeness you will recognise, and um, Robbie might have seen this before. But I just, I think that but it's also important to remember is the way, the different ways in which photography itself was used to represent childhood and how that has changed. And how children's autonomy, children's ability or interest in, in creating their own image has changed too. So that's something that I really want to talk about. I mean, clearly this is, um, this was taken in the sixties. If there's anybody who was a young child in the sixties will know, um, you know, working class families didn't, they, they had studio photographers that came into the house often. And um, they, you'd have a precious few set of photographs actually, and they would be very formal. Um, so this to me is very interesting. So in 1997, um, I was really fortunate. I'm gonna talk a lot about um, Edinburgh institutions really. Um, I, after I made Let's Go to a Place, um, I showed it a series of sort of algorithmic portraits. I'll talk more about that work in a, in a bit. Um, I showed it in London in a show called Gravitas, which was curated by uh, Christiane Monarchy. Um, for, this, for, for this project, Let's Go to a Place, I'd worked with a one entire class, um, a primary seven class, um, and I'd taken portraits of each of them, very much in the style of traditional school photography. Um, and I'm sure you remember that when you were pulled into the, the photo booth, it all happened so quickly. <laughs> and you'd have to have your, your school shirt on. You'd be against a very neutral background, pop. Your photograph would be taken. I photographed, I think it was 30 children in this class. Um, I knew that I wanted to create a kind of group portrait of this class. 
also I really wanted to make a portrait that really in a way identified some of the key sort of interests for them at that time and one thing that I became really interested in and was watching groups of children around about that time playing um, games like Pokemon Go. I remember being quite puzzled by it when I first saw groups of children just wandering around sort of locations looking at their phone. Um, so using sort of GPS and sort of um, collecting data and their data being collected in quite, quite a strange kind of way. So I produced a set of portraits where I took the kind of fractals used in sort of computer gaming and applied it to the portraits. Um, and there was a series of these completed pieces, I think about eight. Um, so it was shown in London, you know, that the, the work was interesting, but then I got into conversation with a really fantastic young curator called Alice Sage, I don't know if she's here tonight, um, who was actually at the time a curator, I think that's right, at the Museum of Childhood. And she said, um, let's do a project in the Museum of Childhood, toys and play, as you'll see as we move through the presentation, have been an abiding interest for me um, right throughout my career. And, and, and latterly in the last year, actually, I've been, I was working in a chapter for a book on surreal, surrealism and play with David Hopkins, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so, you know, the collection actually at the Museum of Childhood, I've always been interested in um, photographically. So it was very interesting, you know, to get the opportunity to juxtapose these very contemporary sort of childhood sort of portraits against the very kind of traditional objects and elements of play here. Um, anybody who's been to the Museum, Museum of Childhood, it's, 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 it's undergoing a sort of revamp, but still I think this display is, is here and it is, it is very beautiful. Um, it's quite a strange museum. It's definitely a museum and um, that's the, that's the portrait. It's definitely a museum that's um, for adults about childhood. So it's very much looking back. Um, and this is just one of the maquettes. So certain objects um, had to be removed, photographs had to be removed, the, the photographs were dropped into the case. And there was that lovely juxtaposition between the, the, the magazine, the child education, the, do, the, the, the boat, the object, the photograph. Um, it was a really nice sort of project to do. And, you know, I, I'm not really sure what people sort of made of it. I mean, I, I think that as an artist, um, for me anyway, you know, one of the best, most exciting things is to be able to sort of sit, situate your work within collections. And I'm sure a lot of artists say, I'm sure it's great being in fantastic group shows because there's nothing better than seeing your work juxtaposed against that of others. So that was certainly an exciting um, project for me to do. I just loved the way that the images talk to the objects. Um, this is another maquette, again, quite a strange, odd display case, but wonderful, these sort of Pelham puppets. And, you know, this strange kind of idea of sort of frozen animation in the display itself was kind of echoed in the photograph, which I, I really liked. Yeah, and also I think looking at these displays and sort of like, I'm sure that many, many of you, especially many of you are artists might spend a lot of time, I certainly do, sort of walking around museums. You'll see this as a kind of theme as I'm talking the work, museums and objects within collections have really influenced um, a lot of bodies of work. But the, the toys within the sort of um, archive at Museum of Childhood are just extraordinarily kind of evocative. And um, yeah, you can't help but be transfixed by this kind of almost barbaric looking kind of hoop and stick. I mean, difficult now to, to imagine that as kind of, sort of an object of play, especially now in a culture where play is so kind of sort of screen based. But again, that's something that I'm sort of interested in looking at in the work itself. Talking about Fabio's collections, um, Marina Warner, who you may have read, what absolutely fantastic, beautiful sort of like writer and amazing sort of uh, critic and curator actually, um, did a great show at Compton Verney called Only Make Believe. And I think you can find this, the, this essay, Self-Portrait in a Rearview Mirror, is, is a beautiful sort of piece of writing. Um, and the, the show was a combination of archival objects. I'll show a couple of, of, of uh, toys. And this was a piece that I shot um, in the Museum of Childhood. It's called Shoe Doll. And a shoe doll is, if, if any of you have been to a museum, you will most certainly remember it as an object. It's one of these uh, talismanic kind of unforgettable kind of things actually. And it's from the Lubbock collection of emergency or emergent dolls. 
So it's a, it, it's a doll made of um, a boot, you know, a miner's shoe. And it's collected, in, this one I think was collected in the East End of London by a, um, a guy called um, William Lovett. Um, and yeah, I mean, really kind of incredible objects sort of uh, in the sort of quite, there's something quite robotic about, about the object, quite strange in the way that you project onto it. And um, yeah, I, I worked quite a lot of that collection and loved the shoe doll. But also in that show, as you know, which included sort of contemporary photography and contemporary work, there were these kind of um, really Frederick Fribel, um, really amazing toys, Maria Montessori sort of toys, wooden toys. So it was like an interesting history of play. And as part of that, you might have seen these images. They're actually in the collection of City Art Centre. They bought these quite a long time ago, actually. This was work shot in, a, a, again, in an Edinburgh primary school, and it was very, very early um, computer class. I mean, I think these children were five and six. Um, and it was, in it. interestingly, I went back to that uh, school maybe three or four years after this was shot to make a film with Channel 4. And um, this classroom had been in cut, entirely ripped out and made into a sort of computer suite. So very, very fast at that period, 1997, you know, it's like the introduction of, sort of computation into schools and primary schools was then just starting to take rapid sort of like pace there. So I wanted to document that, you know, and I think that, you know, something that, that I've always loved about photography um, is that, is it sent, um, you know, it's indexical relationship to reality. Um, you know, so, so, so this idea of documentation is an interesting one. I mean, I did want to document this point of time, but I also wanted to move beyond, obviously what was literally in front of me and try and sort of capture some of the strangeness as well of what, of what I saw at that point was um, children starting to enter into this kind of um, virtual landscape. So, um, shuttling about a bit here. I mean, I've, I, I have continued um, over the years, you know, not so much over the last sort of two, three years actually to work with schools. Um, creativity, clearly, you know, it is of great interest. And I'm very, also, uh, you know, this idea of making something out of nothing, I find really kind of sort of powerful. And of course, children do that better perhaps than, than any of us. And whenever I would go into school to work on a series of portraits, um, such as these ones, um, which were children that had been engaged in sort of uh, robot, robot workshops. I was actually sh shooting humanized robotics at the time, so I was interested in that. I would shoot the portraits. I would, I, and this work was all done when classes were ongoing. You know, I would sort of go into, um, this was an annex of a school and it was using the old church hall. I'd photograph the children playing with the things they'd made, but I'd also photograph the, if I had downtime, I'd photograph the shelves. And there was something really, it was a strange kind of beauty and sort of surrealism to the objects. And um, I found them very sort of poignant. Um, and I just loved the cotton buds and the, the aesthetic, you know. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in these kind of themes, um, last month, um, this book was published uh, by Yale Press. Um, I'm sure you, you, some of you are probably familiar with the, um, Professor David Hopkins. He's the Professor of, of Art History at University of Glasgow. Um, it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful book um, on surrealism and the culture of childhood. And there's an absolutely stunning chapter really original scholarship actually on Paolozzi as well in this book. So if that's something that's of interest to you, um, I can certainly recommend it. Um, and I did the, 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 the last chapter actually um, was on this work, which was an honor, you know, to, to be included. And it, it was great to see the work in that context. So basically, you know, what, what David Hopkins is talking about in that book is he's looking at the shifting role of, sort of the importance of the toy, you know, in, in, in contemporary art production, really, so or start, you know, looking at surrealists onwards to, to present day. And I think that, you know, to play has clearly been dematerialized, you know, in lots of ways. And this was something, again, that both that we were both really interested in. 
And um, you know, you, we, we looked back and I looked at the computer class images from 1997. Every time a technological shift would take place, like you know, school, children be began to access Wi-Fi in schools or as children started to use tablets, I tend to go back into the school and just photograph whatever was going on with that piece of, um, with that technology or that shift at the time. So trying to capture these small kind of moments and trying to sort of make something that for me at least um, was a sort of register of, of that event. I mean, it's just something that really I was really interested in. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, at this point I did have two children of my own you know, so I had a personal I had skin in the game there, you know, I was sort of like really interested and sort of invested. But, you know, I started this work way before I had my own children. To me, this sort of, um, is one of the great kind of subjects of our age, you know, and, and, and this actually was played out, you know, in a sort of a growing awareness of um, managing the way that you spend time online. Um, so that's that work. Yeah, and so now the second half, I'm going to go on something slightly different. So I hope I can keep your interest here. <laughs> so I, I think that one thing that I've been, every, all photographers and, and actually a lot of artists, you know, who work with sort of photography, I've really been thinking about in the last sort of, I would say five years, five to seven years, is that how do you get, you start to work in very different ways and you start to work with different technologies. The gallery doesn't seem right <laughs> or doesn't work for you. How do you show that work? Now, this might be of interest to people that are working in this area. You know, it's certainly um, something that I talk to a lot, think a lot about when I'm working with, with sort of younger photographers. In 2017, I think it was, um, I was commissioned by the, the Photographers Gallery in London I don't know if you, you've been there, but it's it's a lovely space um, across multiple floors um, in, in central London. But one of the things that they do have that was exciting for me is a media wall. Um, and you can see the media wall there. It's um, it's at the front of the gallery. And um, yeah, they commissioned me to make a piece of work called Indeterminate Objects. I'd found myself I'll show you a little bit of the animation of this, Robbie. I'll show you the, the film clip in a minute. I'd, when I'd been doing the work in schools, you know, the, the sort of portraiture, and I'd been working a lot with sort of school glasses, I loved the interiors, the empty interiors of the class. I'd always be there, well, when I was shooting sort of like the, you know, the tinfoil objects, I'd be there at night sometimes or in the morning or at lunchtime where no kids were there. And I found that the classrooms themselves just really quite kind of powerful. And I kind of wanted to, I was really thinking about the, the place of the, the, the importance of school in the lives of children, how that shifted, you know, since the, since really, since the, you know, the, the formation of sort of Children's Act that, that made it legal to go to school, you know, people's kind of the importance and of school, the, I suppose the percentage and texture of learning you did in school compared to what you did outside of school. And the fact that often when all of us then went into school, there'd all be these lots of other kind of like relationships and ideas and concepts churning in our head that were much more really to do with the space of the internet, I think. Um, so I started to play around with these kind of sort of animations, sort of animating the sort of traditional, very traditional Victorian space of the school in, in a way that kind of alluded to some of these ideas. I don't know if you can see the, 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 the top of this. I can't because I've got a kind of like icon bar, but at the top of this, I, the, these, these interiors to me were really compelling. It says our inner selves along the top. And then, you know, you can see these various kind of sort of objects, just wonderful objects made out of, I don't know, crisp packets or old flat, you know, piece of paper to, just on the portraits. I just found them very beautiful and very sort of moving. I just wanted to quickly touch on um, this for maybe photographers who are interested in working in a way that was more unusual. Like th this work that I made, I made it partially on iPad and then converted it to, to computer, then played around and worked work on animation then back to, to photography. The problem with that kind of work, of course, is that you have to find a space to show it, you know? Um, so I made this work and I was very excited by it, but 
I didn't really think anybody else would be. <laughs> so I, I did it. And then I actually think I submitted it to a really great place in Grenigan um, who did a wonderful Biennale. Um, and this the Biennale was called Data Rush. Norderlicht is the place of they have wonderful sort of a, like opens, really challenging. And they accepted it. And um, they showed the work, they did a beautiful catalogue, they showed the work on, on iPads actually. Um, and to be quite frank, it didn't look that great, but um, Katrina Sluis, the, the curator from the Topaz Gallery saw it, really loved it, wanted it to be remade at native resolution for the media screen. So the whole thing was really reworked and it was made for this huge screen and it ran for, I think it was extended to two and a half, three months in, in London. So I think there's a lesson to be learned there <laughs> somewhere for artists that, you know, they really, I, think, I feel it's very important to sort of follow your, um, well, research is clearly really important in the making production of work. But, you know, you know when something is right and you know when you're sort of producing something that you think, yeah, I'm really sort of, um, I feel I'm really pursuing this idea in a meaningful way here, you know. Um, so, yeah, so the work ended up and you'll probably let, you'll let, recognize that landing from the earlier portraits I did. I was a particular favorite school landing of mine in, um, in my local school. So yeah, you know, that was a really great commission and it was a fantastic example of a work that would actually be really unplaceable anywhere else in the UK, maybe in Europe. And again, it's like, you know, I think this sort of also, it's, this is the wonderful thing again about the internet you know, is that you can find everybody, you be, I mean, we're all working, you know, sometimes in quite niche areas. And I think the important thing is to find your tribe, you know, is to find people who are particularly interested in the kind of work you make. And then hopefully, you know, something will happen. Um, so I'm just going to, Robbie, I'm going to pass you to yeah, Robbie. The I'm here. So uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen back so I can show the video one second. Uh, hopefully the technology will work. Uh, right. Oh, you see my entire desktop there. Uh, make that full screen. And away we go. I began to think about how childhood was constructed. And there was two major institutions that dominated. One was the family and the other was school. It did strike me, you know, when you're in a classroom in a school, you know, it's very traditional sort of Victorian space that hasn't changed since the school was built. I think that children's world now is so different and that I wanted somehow to sort of work with that. In uh, the indeterminate objects work, the classrooms work, which is a moving image, crystalline type, clear type forms would just be seen rotating or hovering in a space uh, very much like the classroom we're sitting in now. Using a combination of traditional sort of lens-based technologies and digital techniques can really inject sort of an element of not only surprise, but also an uncomfortable sort of feeling or a kind of this feeling you get when you look at something that's new. I mean, let's go to a place, you know, which was um, a series of sort of composite portraits based on one class, a group of children who were moving really in a way from childhood to adolescence. I set up a, a sort of photo booth and photographed all of the children in front of a very neutral backdrop, very similar to the way that school photographers work. I mean, I think that the way that we sort of photograph ourselves, you know, and photograph our children does tell us quite a lot about sort of attitudes towards sort of, uh, photography and sort of reproduction of uh, childhood. Um, so that, that all feeds in. But I knew I wanted to do something there. So that's, that's where... Yeah, okay, that's stop, great. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Back to the presentation now. Okay. Great. Okay. Well great. So, 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 so just just to say that that's part of our thanks for sharing that, Robbie. That's great. That was um this is part of a five six minute film that was made by the National Gallery. It's called the Digital Mirror. So if you're interested in some of the themes, you can access it through their YouTube site. So. 
So listen, in the last sort of um, 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of um, museums and collections. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that I'm working on now um, um, and then finish up with night gardens. So museums, you know, what's not to, to love about museums? I mean, I think that I really very much missed them actually during lockdown and whenever lockdown broke <laughs> and the museum briefly opened, I'd be back in there. So they've always provided an abiding sort of source of sort of, um, yeah, inspiration for me. I mean, you may you may well have seen this image because um, it's in the national collections, but um, it was also um, in, introduced uh, the exhibition, I think about a couple of years ago now called When We Were Young, which was curated by um, Annie Lydon at the National Galleries. Um, and this was a image shot in the, uh, yeah, in, in the old museum, uh, uh, Royal Museum of Scotland, it was called then, I think it's called the National Museum of Scotland now. Um, so these display cases are, are gone. So interestingly, you know, I do sort of come across some of the objects now and I'm, they've been re hoovered <laughs> and repurposed and put in a different kind of sort of assembly. But when I was working on the school work, I was also following workshop leaders. I worked with the education department in the museum and I would shadow groups as they made their way around the school. I'm sure maybe many of you still remember these trips. I certainly do. And I suppose, again, this interest in the way that, that children's lives were changing with the introduction of, of computation. My parallel interest with the museum was like, you know, how would your sort of relationship to themes and subjects change if you felt like you didn't have to be in front of the object? So often I would photograph um, these vitrines and this, the, the the case, the glass case, almost acted as a screen, and there was this kind of sort of barrier. But this was a particular, this was a sort of particularly sort of key image. I mean, they were just this was a, this old um, display case was beautiful, and it was top lit, um, just a lovely, lovely case. Um, similar, by uh, bison, I think it is. Yeah, it's a bison. Later, I went back. And as you can see in the backdrop, there's a there's an owl just about to to pounce on the smallest tax. I've seen this much smaller things taxidermy, but that mouse is one of them. <laughs> and this absolutely tiny little mouse, and it was just um, kids would be making their way around the museum. I'd be there and just sort of catching them as they were looking at the objects. And I do remember that very that incredible. I still have it, you know, to be quite honest that incredible kind of sort of space between you and this, this thing. I mean, this whole thing, this th thing about animation and sort of life and death, it was really kind of, it's always interested me. Um, and I used to love talking to the museum. I don't call them guards, do they? And um, the people who are working in the museum and they, they would say, children would often ask them, say, is it alive or is it dead? And it's like, well, yeah, it's a really interesting question. That you know, and and I was sort of interested at the same time in robotics and sort of humanoid robotics and the space, the interface between sort of like real and virtual. So these are all very interesting questions, and they were all sort of things that I was trying to somehow address in the images. But I mean, I'm skipping forward now by a long time. I'm sort of like you know, no, not going chronologically, but um, you know, going back to the museum now. I'm still sort of interested in, 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 in objects, you know, but I think that the interests have shifted slightly. I mean, I did, I do think that, you know, the museum now is a space where they have to, you know, and they are thinking much more, for example, about um, extinction, conservation and ethics. And, um, you know, it's certainly something that I thought about a lot when I was looking at the taxidermy as well. I was fascinated in the politics of collecting and where did these objects come from and why, you know? So I think that, you know, as with zoos actually, you know, there is an agenda now um, to, to really rethink um, what the role of the museum is in the survival of, well, in this case, bird species. 
you know, and, and I was thinking about that and I was, you know, looking at these things in the museum as I often do, I think, well, I'm never going to get close to this in, in real life. Um, it's never going to happen. So I'm not going to have the experience of that kind of bird, that animal, but in the museum I can have. So I guess with these works, these sort of fractal works, I wanted to sort of capture that kind of space of what, you know, it, it, you know that they, that they exist in that landscape, but you're aware as well, not only are the numbers often dwindling, but you will never actually have the, that kind of real life encounter with them. This actually is, um, I should do a little bit of PR here because this is um, a couple of editions that haven't been published yet that are being produced at the Edinburgh Printmakers Workshop that are being launched at the end of July. Um, that one and this one. So they're beautiful prints actually, um, but they're part of a series of images um, of um, diving birds, some of which I showed maybe a couple of years ago now at the RSA. And again, shot the, the, these ones were shot against existing dioramas, very beautiful sort of dioramas that I guess were, were painted in the sort of 40s or 50s um, with these sort of strange sort of plummeting birds. Um, these ones are more involved again, sort of um, dusty swans, you know, barrack swans. Very sort of fun, sort of make these images. But this was a, I was in conversation with, um, I'll talk, talk about this one first, with Emma Nicholson, who is the curator at uh, the Botanical Garden. Our, our, well, Botanical Gardens of Edinburgh, um, about the show Flora Legium. Yeah, and she was doing a show which looked, I guess, at, his, at the history of um, the flower from various different angles, whether that's sort of, um, socio-political, um, technological, or it was an interesting show anyway. Um, but I was doing these flower portraits. Um, I have a small garden um, again stage left, it's just off there. And uh, occasionally in downtime, working other things in the studio, I would create these kind of, and I think this is interesting, you know, as, as artists and photographers, you know, you pick up these tools, you know, clearly I was using sort of similar sort of idea of sort of fractal, fractalized image, split image um, in the schoolwork, you know, and I, and I wanted to sort of make a kind of similar intervention. So I started playing around that with sort of these flowers, which I would grow, cut, bring it to the house and just photograph. And then, so, so, so I was in conversation with her at basically to show some of these flower portraits from Flora Legium. But, you know, life intervened and um, my mother got really ill actually, you know, and, and died, you know, in uh, the early part of last year. And at the same time, in my garden, um, a rather strange thing happened. It, it was a very hot May, last May. Uh, you, I'm sure you all remember it was blazing. There was very little water. The garden was amazing. And it was uh, the only place we could really go to get any kind of solace, you know, because everybody was like really having an incredibly tough time. Um, so I started to photograph the flowers, you know, and look over the, the wall during that very odd time. And around about the same time, I'd noticed these, I actually noticed them a few years before, but, and I was almost about, to, just in the corner beside the fence, there's these huge banana-like <laughs> unfurling leaves. And I thought, what? Yeah, I really didn't know what that was. I mean, I, it was something clearly I'd got from somewhere, maybe like an open garden or something, I, I couldn't remember. Um, so there's many times where I used to, I was, I was so busy the, the few years before that, I just left it. But anyway, last year, the leaves got bigger and bigger. I mean, they actually started to sort of come across the path. Um, so I thought, wow. And then, you know, a few weeks later, it's like Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, this thing sprung up. Now all the time, you know, my mother's, you know, we were all being, she was inside. She started to, to, to be unwell. I mean, she, her health started to steeply decline. And as that was happening, I was lit literally daily watching this this plant come up, and it was the the drama of it was a welcome sort of sideshow to the the rest of the the sideshow. These are the seed pods. Eventually, the thing was eight foot tall, and the the seed pods were just incredible things. 
And eventually, one night, um, just after my mother died, actually, I went out and photographed this lily, which I'd since found out was a cardiocrinium giganteum. Um, my brother-in-law, one of the very few people to visit the house during that lockdown, came over, he's a tree surgeon, and said, oh, you know, you're really lucky, that's um, a cardiocrinium giganteum, native to the Himalayas. Um, ironically, the first one was it was naturalised or was grown in, in Britain, in Edinburgh, actually, in a nursery in Cumberley Bank, and I think 1854. So I was talking, we got talking to, to Emma, and she thought, this is a great story. Let's make a piece of work about that. Um, these are the seeds. As you can see from the stalk behind me, if I touch that, there are literally thousands of seeds. So if anybody's interested in growing one, they can get in touch. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that was my daughter holding the, the, the seeds um, when, they, when, they, when they fell. And this was the work um, installed at Inverleith House. And beside it, sorry, I don't have the text here, but it's on my website, the text in full, and you can read the text. It was interesting for me because it was obviously a very personal project, but I did find that people really responded to it. So that's always, you know, it, it's always great. And it reminds you, of course, of the sort of power of, of, of photography, actually, and, and storytelling. So, and, you know, and it was great to work in such a beautiful space and such lovely surroundings. So that is my last image. So I think I will stop it there. And if anybody wants to ask any questions, do feel free to, to well, jump in. Hi, Wendy. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, th th thank you so much. And um, we'll do we'll do the thank yous at the end. But there have been a few questions come in and comments and so on. There's a few things I'd like to ask you. So I'll go right back to the first one that came in right at the beginning. Um, uh, um, and it's um, I'm not sure it's from SC. Hi, Wendy. Really looking forward to this talk. I love your work and have followed it for years now. As a new graduate, the camera is fundamental to my practice, but I don't know if I consider myself a photographer. Um, the, the, this presents problems sometimes when it comes to approaching galleries who may be more exclusive to photography. Could you talk at all about how you navigated this? Did you get all that, Wendy? Yeah, yeah. No, no. It, yeah, I mean, it's a, it, 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 it's a good question, actually. You know, I mean, I think that now, you know, I, to, I sort of, I'm doing something actually in, in Shanghai in September, and that's kind of like a, it's not a photography show, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's video, it's film, it's sort of new media. Um, Florilegium, for example, was, there was operatic performance that was drawing and painting. I was the only photographic element, there was video. So that was sort of mixed media show. Um, I think that, you know, photography, that's why for, for me, photography is so interesting because there's, you know, there are multiple ways of kind of, I think it's it's what you want to say that's the important thing. Now the, the tool that you pick up to do that may be a camera, but it might not be. You know, it may be a piece of software or, you know, I don't know, it could be sculpture. You know, I mean, I, th I think that, um, I, I, if, yeah, I mean, I suppose my reputation now is, is like, you know, as a photographer, sort of like make a bit of film. But I studied as a painter, you know, and, 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 and as, actually, or as, a, as a printmaker. Um, so I, I actually like the tyranny of photography. I don't enjoy, you know, I mean, I, I think that you should feel free to, to work across whatever medium. And perhaps, I mean, you know, I, for a long time, I guess, people knew that I was interested in, you know, like interested in sort of um, digital play and education. And then, you know, things come out of that. So I would say, my, define your subject, you know, what am I really interested in? And if you happen to work with photography and that, that's great, but then you can always sort of work across mediums. Identify yourself through your themes, not your, your material. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Wendy, the you trained as a painter printmaker and how much at that time did photography play a role in your image making i know that was when you were a student and, and you moved quickly on to photography but did, was that was there always an undercurrent of the, the lens-based imagery well i mean i am um, photography just wasn't really an option serious option when i studied and it wasn't till i went to new york for a couple of years i actually went to a place called pratt institute in the 80s 
And I got there and I just started seeing the most incredible photography like I'd never seen, like conceptual photography. You know, what amazing work. Um, I thought, this is what I'm interested in. You know, I found the, 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 the right sort of medium for me and I started to see other people using that language. Um, so yeah. yeah. I, I went to New York for the first time in 1989 and I was amazed, and at that time I hadn't seen any photography in major galleries, and to suddenly see huge, uh, huge cibachromes and so on in galleries, it was it was a revelation to me, and that actually follows on to the uh, uh, another question by the same the same person, and how important is the relationship between the gallery and the artist these days, i.e., social media, etc. You know, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think social media is really important. Um, because it's a way, and you know, for me too, you know, it is a way that people sort of um, pick up on sort of ideas. So I, I think that, you know, if I'm talking sort of younger artists about their work, and some of them have got work incredibly hard at that, and the work, the work's got to be great. Yeah, that's that's a given. But I think that it's a hugely um, powerful tool. You know, you can't really avoid using it because it allows you to reach your audience, whoever that is. I mean, the role of galleries is, I mean, since I first started, has, I think, really, really tailed off. You know, I mean, gallery support is, is wonderful. You know, it's great. But I think that now artists are much more used to sort of um, working in a much more autonomous way or across many different organisations. You know? I think particularly with photography is where does that, where does the photography exist? Is it in the, is it in the computer? Is it on the screen? Is it in books? Is it in the gallery? Where where do you see it existing or across all of these things? Is it a non-fungible token? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this is something that's that, that is being really debated. You know, where does it exist? Where does an idea exist? And this is what NFTs as well are sort of starting to sort of deal with. And actually, I was talking to somebody at DAX, Designer and Artist Copyright Society today, because they're launching something as a sort of scheme, which you'll hear about. Um, but, but, but trying to remunerate artists um, for, you know, times their work has, has, has copied, you know, online, because um, that is also a problem. Um, but, you know, where does work exist? I mean, personally, I think as soon as you exhibited work, you published work, then yeah, you can share freely and it's that, you know, I mean, people have different, you know, I, I might be a little bit kind of, sort of more circumspect, circumspect in that respect but some people love to sort of share work online and that's fine for them and that's where the work resides you know and I've seen some of the most powerful so I remember seeing a really early one of the very first pieces of work made for the internet made by Susan Hiller it was a web piece made she made for the Dia Art Foundation so we're talking about in the 80s and it was her mellifluous voice over a series of sort of like colour screens I've never forgotten that piece of work it, that that is a tangible real piece of work for me so that piece of work exists in me, you know? So I think that work can exist in lots of different ways and it all very much depends on the type of work. Well, even now during this, this, this lockdown period, you know, we've, we've all adapted, galleries have adapted, Matterport has become a, 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 a way of navigating a space artificially to kind of give us a sense of what the work looks like. Um, and people are taking more of a risk in buying work that they've never actually physically had in their hand. And so, you know, photography has been there been there for years, whereas things like painting and sculpture, it's a very, it's a very different, tangible thing, I guess. Um, um, a few more comments and questions. This work is beautiful, Wendy, on a technical level. What software were you using in the 90s to remove the computers from the photos? And how does that compare with what you, you now use to remove with iPads, etc.? Yeah, it's not changed that much. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, in, initially, the very early work, it was shot in the film and then it was drum scanned um, for the photographers out there. I mean, thank, I really am very glad that I drum scanned it, you know, because drum scanning, a little bit technical interlude here, drum scanning allows you to get every, as much information out of a negative transparency as possible. So I invested in that, which was a big investment for me at that stage in my career and getting a lot of professional drum scanning done, but then laterally, I won't be a tech care. My camera's got digital. I'm still working shooting in the same Hasselblad, but it's digital. You know, so I shoot to digital files and the manipulation is just all done in, you know, all the way it always has been in Photoshop. But um yes, yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. You know, I mean I, 
I think I try and keep things as simple as possible. I really like simplicity. Um, and, you know, I think that for me anyway, you know, and I think this is a useful thing to sort of think about if there's any sort of artists who are struggling with that. I feel that sometimes it's really useful to write about what you're trying to say in your work. And I think if you can nail it in language, then it, getting into the work itself is a piece of cake. I think something sometimes just articulating your kind of um, sword ambitions, your desires for the work in language can really help. Um, so that I, te I tend to really think, <laughs> I mean, I tend to sit and work for a long time, you know, and I might actually go back to work, you know, after a year or two years and I'll suddenly, I'll, like today that happened to me, I thought about one image that was just like not, not doing anything. And then I suddenly thought, no, that, that's why, and this is what I've got to do. So I'll go back to it. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a long process for, for some artists. Other artists work very, very differently. But for me, it's, um, yeah. yeah, it takes a long time, you know. So can I just go back to the school work, the works set in the, in the schools and the projects and the 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 the, sculpt, the, 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 um, the the things, the toys they made and so on. So how much of what you do are you being a documentary maker? How much is it? Are you a participant or an influencer? I mean, are are you being passive or are, um, active in that that relationship? What what what's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well. That's a very interesting question, you know, and this, this idea of sort of uh, participatory photography is actually something that a lot of photographers, documentarians now are very interested in because it's well bound up in the ethics of photography. Yeah. Yes, I've written yeah. ethics down here, but I didn't want yeah. to bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I've heard some very interesting talks on that over the last sort of few years. I mean, it, you know, especially I think working with sort of like um, children, you know, and in sort of education, the way that I tackled that um, and worked with that is that I work directly with the school authorities and teachers and parents at every stage of production. You know, I mean, often I have children who are now adults, you know, coming back to me and asking for prints and stuff. And, you know, it's really lovely to be able to sort of share them. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that it certainly isn't collaboration that work, but there's a certain participatory element in it because the children obviously are taking part in the process of being photographed and they're photographed as they're doing their, their workshop, their class and museum visit. So to, to that extent, it is participatory, but I am also very kind of sort of vigilant at every step towards making sure that that is with. Yeah, they, they, they feel like they're not intruding, but they feel very much about that they're, they're it's a safe environment that they're in with being them being photographed with the children the children are present that's the session the pressure yeah. I get as well yeah I mean I, I think that that's um I didn't show the very early work so sort of that you know the, the, the work that sort of started my career the project called initiated place but that's all documented mm -hmm. in other places but that again was the first time I'd worked in that way and uh, it was very much my intention to observe yeah. the yeah. rehearsal rather than promote or provoke a performance, do you know what I mean? Um, so that's that's just some, the way that I like to work and I've always worked like that, so. Okay, just picking up a couple of other things, Claire Henry, I think this was right early on, she, she asked, was some of the work shown at the Museum of Childhood in Edinburgh? But I think you answered that, that it, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and was that really, was that something that they asked you to do or was that something that you, because you started photographing work there that that they took that on no that was that was part of the edinburgh art festival yeah um, and it was as i said it was um alice stage it was the oh, curator yeah. Yeah. Who, who's just actually i believe finished her PhD, got her phd now at goldsmith who was totally interested in the subject so i think that you know working in museums is great and i love it and i'd love to do more of it actually but it's also dependent on finding pure sympathetic curatorial support you know because museums are there to be museums, they're not there to be art galleries, you know. But I do think also, uh, you know, our, their national collections are for us to use and to document as as artists. And 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 we do. Um, I know Robbie that I'm sure you did, and you probably send students that still to sort of draw in these kind of places. That um, it's very much part of the, of your life as an artist, you know. 
Actually, I mean, again, it's something I wrote down less so now, actually, because the, the role of the, you were talked about, about the role of the museum and the way museums are now exploring art, uh, collections is very different. It's not a it's not a, a diorama of lots of little objects in the way it perhaps was. I mean, I know the, the Pitt Rivers in Oxford is, celebrates that as one of my favorite museums where yeah. the museum in Edinburgh, it's more like a gallery than it was. And there's more digital content and. It's a different. It's a different beast to take students to go and draw because it isn't. It doesn't quite have that same, that same kind of tactile quality that perhaps we we used to. But but it's still an, uh, an incredibly important resource. And um, we're just about out of time. Just finally, and I think this is shared by us all. This is from Kate Downey, a fellow RSA and artist. Uh, these are just beautiful works, Wendy. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to give her, I know, I know uh, Kate would be very exuberant when she said that. Uh, I so wish I'd seen them in London, so thank you. And I think that, I think uh, our time is uh, just about up, Wendy. I think that has been an extraordinary snippet, insight, a slice of what you do, uh, so eloquently put. And I don't, I don't know if we can get everyone to applause and you hear that, but a, a big thanks from everybody that's here that's uh, attended. I think we've had about 27 people in total have come tonight. So thank you very much. Cool. That, thanks thanks for coming along it's really great um i hope you've enjoyed it you know if you if there's anything else you want to know you can get in touch with me uh, uh, via the website but um yeah i hope to see you all at some point perhaps at the rsa and thank you to robbie and to Fishina as well for, for hosting it was it was great to, to get the opportunity to, to speak to you tonight